five, four, three, two, one. Fragments of silicon. Not too hard, not too soft. I wonder what you've been reading recently. <laughs> I was trying to I make know. a I was trying to make a mineral hardness joke, but I couldn't remember the exact number. I was like, "Oh my god, dude!" Like, I don't know if you heard me, but I said under my breath, "Gross." <laughs> oh, it was picked up before I even okay. muted you guys too, so that's recorded. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> welcome to another installment of Fragments of Silicon. I'm your host Adam, and joining me as always is the regular crew. Um, right, so we're running a bit uh, late this week because we had to do some extra setting up because we got a whole bunch of codes to give out today and um, indeed on Sunday. But everything's been sorted out. We will be giving out um, 10 multiplayer codes of Overload. They are multiplayer beta codes. They are not full codes, so um, they'll only last until the 31st, I believe. But... Um, if you're here for that, just head to our Discord server, and they will be doled out in due time. Literally, yeah. they're on timer. So. I was actually going to mention how to do that real quick. If you well, on, go ahead. In the Discord, you'll scroll up a little bit, and you'll see a post from Giveaway Bot. There's a little React Tada. That's a little like red popper thing. Just under its post, click that, and you will be entered. Once the timer expires, it will select 10 winners. All right. All right, so, yeah, just keep an eye out for that, and um, hopefully you'll get your code. Anyway, um, so on to the news. Uh, let's see. Well, Petty Fan, you, uh, why don't you start us off this week? Oh, let's see. I actually got some games this week. I got... Crash Bandicoot the Insane Trilogy, Horizon Zero Dawn Complete Edition, and Xenoblade Chronicles X. So, yay. And I also have coming in the mail a um, Samsung Gear Sport. So that's going to be fun. Hmm. Hopefully, you know, the guy I bought it from on eBay he didn't scam me. <laughs> What's his feedback, though? Uh, like 500 positive and like 9 negative. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. acceptable margin. Acceptable margin. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I'm also, um, we're also going to tomorrow be getting an estimate on getting the house recited, so that's going to be fun. Recited? Yeah. Uh, you know, the old um, siding pulled off and then new vinyl siding put on. Ah, ah there you go. I thought you said sighted. Well, it's same thing. Yeah. Words are hard. Yes, yes. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I think that's it for me. Alright, Galix. Uh, I picked up uh, Pyro Warriors Definitive Edition. Um, this is the third time I have bought that game. I probably should have skipped Legends. Uh, le I mean, it's the the new stuff they added in Legends was nice, but the 3DS has some significant performance issues when yeah. dealing with games of that size, which the Switch version basically includes all that stuff and doesn't have performance issues. So, well, yeah, the, the Hyrule Warriors, um, well, first of all, it should never have been available for the regular 3DS. Like, yeah, I had a new 3DS, and I still it still had a lot of problems with uh, loading enough enemies. Mm hmm So, yeah. But, uh, so, that's nice. I've only played through a few stages of that. Um, 
I was on the team of the final victor for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Splatfest tournament thing. So that's nice. I was, uh, what, two for one, two to one, two wins, one loss out of the three. So that was also nice. Um, Anything else? Uh, not a whole. Oh, uh, the uh, this is related to the topic of discussion. Uh, since I backed Bloodstained, the uh, Steam codes for uh, Curse of the Moon came out today for backers, although right. obviously the game isn't actually downloadable yet. But So I have that entered, and I will be getting that when it comes. Is that, what, tomorrow? Uh, uh, tomorrow. With it, yeah, it's soon. In five hours. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll pick it up next month. It's like it's hard. It's hard to play things when you're constantly reviewing stuff week in, week out. <laughs> First world problems, Adam. I know, I know, I know. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm the one who has to review the most stuff because sometimes you only get like one code. Right, right. Anyway, um, anything else? Um, guess not. Not really. Um, no. oh, uh, Ogre, you're up. Uh, let's see. Recordings are going fine. Mm. We're trying to set up for this D and D thing here lately, which is kind of interesting. But I'm not all that on board with it right now. I mean, mm. I'm gonna do it, but I'm kind of like, I just, I want to get out of here before we deal with this shit more. Real life D and D? I think I have no clue, but uh, I think it's going to be a one-off thing, and then we'll see how it goes from there. What is this? Something not the wants to do? Yeah, something Nock and Barry wants to do. Uh, anyway, hmm. outside of that, yeah, recordings are going fine. Let's see. I picked up the Mega Man Legacy Collection for the Switch. Because as Gal- as Galix, I too have I am owning it on multiple systems and do not give a shit what people think. Because yep. I like Mega Man and you can go fuck yourself if you don't like that. <laughs> Dude, uh, I'm about to own Sonic Mania for the third time. Yeah, I know, but it's just one of those preemptives. Yeah, yeah, I'll spend my money how I want to spend my <laughs> money. And if I want to buy a collection for a third time on a system that I really like, Ain't none of your problem. Uh, let's see. Other than that, new patch for 14 hit, so busy, busy beat on that for the time being. People are bad at math, and it's funny. <sighs> I haven't even done that, and I see this stuff, and I go, like, you add your number as long as it's divisible by what he's asking for. And it's basic math. Oh, dear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I haven't run it yet, but trust me, it's going to be one of those ones where I'm going to screw up every once in a while, but I'll be getting there going like, people, this ain't that fucking hard. <laughs> Keep trying to kill yourselves with the Chocobo meteors that I can see every <laughs> once in a while. I don't know what that shit's all about, but I'll get there when I get there. <laughs> Uh, But other than that, that's been me, so... Alright, Twilight? Um, let's see here now. Well, um, Saturday, um, me and my uncle changed the oil in in my uh, mother's car. And I continue to hate how car manufacturers handle oil filters these days. Because of that, or more like I'm being reminded of how much I hate them for that. Uh, we managed to get through, uh, as always. Um, let's see now. Um, we've continued the, um, D&D-like campaign, um, with the Elven Ruins and, um, and the Goblin Infestation, and I'm pretty sure there's a Goblin in every freaking room in that place. Well, I think that's part of what an infestation <laughs> is. Yeah, that's yeah. what Goblins do. They get, they get every Yeah. Yeah, I know that, but still, it, it took us longer to get through some rooms than it should have. Should have. <laughs> um, 
anyway, um, in terms of games, I've been playing uh, an older game that we'll be talking about a little bit later here. And I forgot how much I liked it. And uh, I do plan on picking up Bloodstained Curse of the Moon tomorrow. And um, hopefully it turns out as well as it uh, looks. And, um, and I've been playing the games for this um, Sunday, and that's about it. All right, um, Mac, you, it's your go. <laughs> Everybody's talking about Bloodstained. There, there's a certain irony to this, and that is that my, my ex jumped in on the Kickstarter for that mm-hmm. on the ground floor and put it in at the $60 tier. And uh, she hounded me for months to, or for weeks, I should say, to try and up our pledge $40. And then she left, and uh-huh. she has the pledge in her name, and I have the PlayStation 4. <laughs> hmm. Have you been keeping up with the surveys of what you want everything on and stuff? Nope, and I'll tell you why. I did not put the extra $40 in, because I did not care about getting some goddamn figure for this game. <laughs> and she wanted it, and this was already after things were on the rocks, so investing extra money in things that we would co-own is a little bit like trying to split the estate in a divorce. Yeah. So, you know, whatever. Um, that is, that is, I, I'm probably going to get it at some point because, you know, I do still love me some Metroidvania. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's it for gaming. Uh, the, the big thing for me right now is that, uh, of course, you guys know this from the chat, but um, Space Destroyer Hunter is going forward as a mini series instead of as a multiple season thing. Not to say we won't do more OVAs, but we're planning on doing a six episode mini series. And so I'm getting to the task of finalizing the cast. Uh, we still have Kaylee Mills, Kira Buckland, uh, Jeff Strange, Skylar Davenport, and David J.G. Doyle, my old friend from Australia also known as Aussie Roth, the Australian Sephiroth. <laughs> yeah, that's a long story. Uh, also recognized by Peter Cullen as a reasonable facsimile of Optimus Prime. <laughs> so uh, he's got a bit of an impressive resume, but he's more of a blogger and podcaster than, than really known for his voice acting. But yeah, I'll take what I can get at this point. You know what I mean? <laughs> So, um, trying to sort some stuff out, I stated in no uncertain terms that I wanted Vic Min- Mignana to actually play a role in this film, and now I'm I'm going to do a bad and say this on the air, but I'm kind of rethinking that. <laughs> hmm. Largely because I want to get a different person to play that character, and uh, possibly get our old friend Richard Epcar to uh, play Gunnar Brill. That would be nice. Yeah, I was really thinking about it, and I'm like, you know, he played he played Bowman so well back in the day, and he still sounds like that. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, mm, I got, I'm going to put the feeler out there. He had said he he had said he you remember on the show he had said he was amenable to uh, to uh, doing some indie work with me. I Super remember. nice guy. Yep. Yes. So I you know I threw the feeler out there and. Uh, We'll see. I haven't gotten a, I haven't gotten a yes or no yet, so that's that's a hopeful. But yeah, I've got I put out a I put out a uh, mock up of the opening credit sequence, which is very static and bland compared to what we really have planned. But think of it's it more mock- like yeah, it's a mock up. And what I really wanted to get out there was the uh, the opening theme because I've revised it, I processed it through new sound fonts. I changed the the tempo, the timing. Uh, I transposed three half tones on it, and oh my god, does it sound better? <laughs> Did all this work, and I uh, don't have a a lick of musical experience other than listening to it and sometimes humming and singing badly to it. So I'm, I'm extraordinarily pleased with that accomplishment. 
So yeah, we're going forward with it. Uh, Keith and I have actually already started developing at true animation assets. We will not be using a single frame from the from the graphic novel that Grace Allison and I did eight years ago. <laughs> That's out of the picture. So any of the artwork that you see in the mock-up, not a frame of that will appear in the final version. <laughs> in fact, we're not even going to launch the Kickstarter until we have the new animation assets to replace all of that. And uh, uh, I'm actually tasking Keith with drawing all of the underdrawings for the main animation assets, and I am inking and coloring them on stream over the next few weeks. So if anybody wants to see that, be sure to check in to my Picardo channel. Uh, it's uh, picardo.tv forward slash Mace Paladino. And uh, you'll be able to see me developing the assets for Space Destroyer Hunter, which I have to say, Keith really stepped up his anime game. Um, and we're going to do something a little bit along the lines of, uh, uh, and I'm sure I guarantee you that Hal Sutherland and Norm Prescott will be rolling in their graves when we do this, but we're going to be doing some uh, 1970s filmation style anime. Uh, reminiscent of the animated Star Trek series. So I'm also looking for veterans of that. I've got my eyes on a couple of people on YouTube who are making brand new, quote unquote, episodes of the animated series. So um, not worried about their voice acting, only want their technical skills. <laughs> so, yep, that's it for me. That's my big news for this week. Uh, let's see. I guess it's my go. Uh, let's see, I guess the big news in my court this week is I had to take my uh, cat in to the vets for his annual checkup. Like, he's doing fine. He um, he had fleas, but um, the medication came in the other day. He seems to be doing better. Like, um, also, uh, he's getting old. He's about 12, 13 years old. Jeez. They do do. They do tend to do that. Yeah, it's just uh, the vet was trying to push one hundred and fifty dollars worth of blood work on on me, and yeah, that wasn't happening because uh, I, yeah, Isis is exhibiting some signs of aging, but he doesn't need blood work. I mean, it's not a bad diagnostic tool, but if you can't afford it, it's also not the end of the world. Yeah, it's like it's not something that's that was going to be shelled out at this point in time. He didn't need it, and you know, he's doing fine. Like, um, and yeah, that's about it for me this week. So that's it for the news. So merrily we shall roll along to the interview portion of the broadcast, and this week we've got. Mike Kulas and uh, Matt Schuslong of uh, Revival Productions. Hello. Hello. This is Mike. Yes. All right. Um, so we usually like to start things by getting to know the people behind the studio, behind the game, and we start things off by finding out how you got interested in the video games in both a professional and personal level. Uh, I'll go. <laughs> um, I, can't, I can't remember that far back. I'm way older than you. I can barely hear you, Matt. Can... I'm right here. It doesn't yeah. matter if I can hear you. Oh, yeah. He's so, a little uh, quiet, but it's not too bad. Is it on my end? I, yeah, I think I can hear him just fine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Hmm. All right. So I started programming on my uh, Apple II back in the 70s, and uh, I got a lot of cracked games uh, from my roommate. Um, and and uh, I thought, well, I, I want to learn to make it like that, which, of course, back in the late 70s and early 80s meant you learned assembly language. Um, and then I dropped out of school. I was fortunate to live in uh, the uh, same town that Bruce Hartwick and um, Sublogic, uh, of course, uh, existed. So I went to work for Bruce Hartwick on Flight Simulator, and that was all. That was 100% assembly language again on the IBM PC, 68, what, with the Atari, the Mac, and the Amiga 68,000 base computers. So I, I felt like I wasn't really in the game industry relations, um, and we weren't really we were really technology 
program. So not, not so there was a game element to it, but uh, what I really liked doing was uh, working with Bruce and the other people there, and uh, really just do, doing hard stuff, doing 3D graphics back in the early 80s. Um, and that's also where I met Matt. Uh, Matt, what year was that? 1986 or seven? Uh, late 86. Uh, yeah, I got hired on. Mike was my boss. Memory. Uh, 32 years. <laughs> and you were the, an Amiga expert, right? I was what? You were the Amiga guy. That's right. I had an Amiga, which was a great yeah, machine. That's right. You owned one even, and then uh, and you, then you ported a Jet to the Amiga. Uh, the, my very first task was actually getting uh, Jet working on the Mac. Um, oh. and, and you know, this was in the days when Mac didn't Max didn't have color, so we had big tables of dither patterns for drawing the different shades of gray. That was uh, quite a little adventure back there. And uh, yeah, and then we worked on a bunch of 68,000 stuff. And uh, and then I did that uh, TRS-80 Color Computer 3 port, which was also kind of fun. So 6809, it had a multiply. Yeah, it had a multiply. It had great. It was a great processor. I, that was a fine, fine little processor. Anyway, so Mike and I, Mike and I, as Mike said, met at Sublogic. Um, and then I went off and did some contract work, and eventually I needed uh, some help on the contract work I was doing. So Mike came on and helped with that. Uh, and I was doing contract work for uh, a company called Learner Research, which was run by Ned Lerner, who wrote um, Chuck Yeager's Advanced Flight Trainer, which was a pretty big game for EA back in the day, and a competitor to the stuff we've been doing at Sublogic. And, uh, and Ned's company merged with, with a company called Blue Sky Productions, which was run by Paul Nurath, and the resulting merger was uh, Looking Glass Technologies. Oh, wow. So Mike and I both ended up at Looking Glass. Uh, and uh, I was an employee there in uh, Lexington, Mass, and Mike was working remotely from, from Illinois. And uh, I worked there for about a year, and then Mike and I left and went off in foreign parallax to make Descent. Mm. Like, yeah, we met Paul uh, a couple years ago, around the time... Um the other side Kickstarter was starting to take shape. Excellent. Yeah. Like, it's interesting the people you meet along the line doing this uh, line of work. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, you formed uh, Parallax and uh, you created uh, Descent. That's right. Yeah, that was our first game at Parallax Software. Um, we signed a contract with Apogee, who had just done... Wait, Wolf, Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein 3D, yeah. Wait, they did Wolfenstein, uh, so it, it software developed. Are we getting this right, Matt? Did Apogee publish that? Yeah, and then, but then it left and went off and did Doom on their own, so Apogee was kind of looking for somebody else to, to work with. So and there they, we were, and uh, they thought we were making a Doom clone, and some other people have called us that uh, over time. He thought we were just kind of making a flight simulator that was underground um, and had lots of stuff to shoot. Yeah, so it's sort of, Matt, like we took what we did uh, on Flight Simulator and had a lot more game to it. Um, we, we, we took we took the dungeon game at Looking Glass yeah. and the Flight Simulator and we shoved them together. I, uh, we're so derivative, but uh, that, <laughs> that, that really is it. It's a flight simulator in a dungeon. <laughs> And it, it was it was actually a very um, uh, exciting, but also very scary project. We got canceled seven months in. We had just hired uh, Adam Fletcher, our first artist, and what in his first week there, <laughs> we yeah. got terminated by Apogee. Yeah, that was fun. Um, they were they were kind enough to mail us a check, and about five later mail us a termination note if they could have done that of course not sent the check so they were actually pretty nice about it. Uh, um, they had faith in the game and it's not that surprising it was really a tech demo at that point because we didn't have an artist um, but anyway uh, we pretty quickly signed with interplay and very supportive of, of us so we had a great producer Rusty Buecher uh, they had great musicians over there um, and uh, and we have some of the people um, and anyway, so we did Descent, we did Descent 2, um, and then Matt and I went our own ways for a while, and what, 20, 20 years after Descent 2, pretty much is when, what, Matt, you got 
started programming again. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mike and I used to talk every in once this in a case, while. Uh, overlap. Yeah, and we every once in a while we talk and we'd say, oh, we should do an, uh, an updated descent game sometime, and and uh, you know every once every once in a while we have that conversation, and then uh, everything just sort of lined up right a few years back. Um, probably the biggest factor being that uh, Luke Schneider, who was a level designer on Descent Three and and a designer on a bunch of Volition games, was available and interested, uh, and wanted to work on the project. So we uh, we started it up. With, with just him, really, at the beginning. <laughs> ah, there's the motorcycle we warned you about. Uh, yep. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, trust me, it, it, it's almost like clockwork at this point. Mm -hmm. like, and mm -hmm. so, you know, if we could uh, do something about that, we would, but we can't, so... Um, uh, goes, go, goes to record... <laughs> All day, perfectly quiet. Goes to record lines for client. Blah! <laughs> he's not wrong. No, no he's not. Like, uh, right, anyway. So, um, bit to unpack he here. Uh, did you ever try getting the, uh, the old uh, Descent license back? Oh. oh, Matt, that's a good story for you to tell. Uh, well, you know, we've had a long and, and colorful relationship with Interplay. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much you guys know about it, but Interplay at this point um, is a fairly small operation that is, uh, you know, putting out some, some of their old um, library of titles and, and doing stuff like that. Um, but at, at one point, we were not getting paid by Interplay, and we ended up terminating our contract with them, and we've since had a, a somewhat of a reconciliation. Um, but at the time we started up, uh, we weren't really uh, we weren't really in a good place with Interplay and decided we would just do it without the uh, the Interplay name, without the Descent name. And, and coincidentally, uh, there was another game that started up probably about the same time we did. We were several, we were, what, six months or a year into our game before we even heard about it. But, but that title is licensing the Descent name, so... Uh, it didn't make sense really to have two Descent games coming out at the same time, uh, so we uh, we went with our own name. Hmm. Indeed, um, we've actually talked to Descendants a few years back. Like, uh, I think that uh, Descent Underground or uh, is still in early access. They pulled it from early access, I think. Yes, they did. They pulled it a few months ago, and. Uh, after that, I forget exactly when they announced. Uh, I think they sort of announced the date of, or you know, a season fall of this year, I believe. Yeah. Uh, uh, that the game would be coming out, and I, I think Little Orbit uh, was investing in the game and was assisting, or, or anyway, providing funds for development. So um, I haven't. I don't hear updates. My sense is that Kickstarter backers at a certain level have. have have had access to updates, but uh, we haven't seen anything on it. And we talked with those guys on and off for a little while. Um, but uh, I don't know about you, Matt. I haven't heard from, from them in no. like a year now, probably. No, yeah. not, not in a while. Yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, so what's the response been to Overload? I, I know it's been uh, anticipated in um, certain gaming circles because, I don't know, we're kind of in a year of um, retro FPS revival, the likes of Dusk and a medieval and strafe coming out. Um, the, the response has been great, really. I mean, there's a, a really um, passionate group of people out there who are Descent fans and, and even some who still play the game multiplayer today uh, who are pretty excited. I mean, perhaps a little skeptical, but, but optimistic. Uh, and we've really, uh, it's been great getting feedback from them and hearing their stories and having them involved with the project. So that's been a really, uh, a really great experience. Yeah. I, I had, um, and I think Matt also had just become disconnected from the whole descent community for when we were in the middle of free space, I kind of didn't have time to pay attention to what was going on with descent. And, and I think after Matt was done with descent three, the same probably applied to him. We moved on to make other projects and, um, 
I had no idea that there were still people uh, making levels, playing, and so we, we pretty much, I don't know if the term is open source, but we pretty much dumped the source out there and people could do whatever they wanted for non-commercial purposes. And they had really done a lot with the game and I didn't know about that. So when we got back and uh, Matt and I started actively working on Overload, I started catching up on starting with old Usenet posts from the 80, uh, 80s and, not, or excuse me, from the 90s in the uh, early 2000s and uh, just Facebook groups and so forth where people had uh, were still t talking about the game that we created in the 90s so and here we were you know making a spiritual successor a, a, you know structurally very similar game and it was it was a lot of fun to uh, what people had been doing with it for the past uh, about 20 years at that point so th the support has been really good um, the hardcore people uh, and th that play Descent or uh, people that were drawn to that community have been incredibly supportive of the game. The reviews have been very strong. Um, and now we're here well, a week, a week and uh, yeah. a week and a day. Releasing. And yeah. uh, one thing we learned is that we need to, we need it to go beyond that audience. It's a very passionate, very supportive audience, and that's been great. But we need to go beyond that. So. Um, Hopefully, you know, the game makes a big splash when it comes out. We've done a lot of things to make that happen. And uh, it's going to it's gonna be very, the, <laughs> the game is pretty much done. Um, so it's just uh, tying up some loose ends and we'll be out on May 31st. Really looking forward to what happens there. Indeed. Well, I mean, um, your game certainly stands out because <clears throat> unfortunately there haven't been a lot of six degrees of freedom shooters in recent memory or really ever like it's not a subgenre that it was ever super populated with um entries which i always found a shame but i can understand why it never took off because uh descent and indeed from what i played of overload can be very confusing like, yeah i see you're using the guide uh, or excuse me the holo guide so that's uh, part of uh, the attempt to make the game less confusing, you can get extremely lost, um, but he'll take you to the next objective. So, um. it's a, there is a certain a certain learning curve that you have to get used to to you know being able to move in every direction and, and get over that initial disorientation. Uh, but I think once you you know once you have that you know first uh, first experience under your belt, then it, it's really not that bad. Uh, and I think it's pretty rewarding in, in the complexity of gameplay and navigation and exploration that you get. That you, you know, you could not get in a, a more flat world. I think um, uh, two things that uh, have happened that will make it more accessible now. I think um, the game actually plays really well on a gamepad, and uh, those pretty much didn't, didn't exist in the 90s. Um, and another well, thing that happened is, I think... Uh, or, well, yeah, and, and those joysticks were pretty expensive uh, uh, back then, and some people were using dual joystick setups. So, and, and one thing that was happening, I would say, not long after Descent came out, is a lot of gamers didn't see any need for joysticks anymore. First-person shooter and uh, real-time strategy games, they were mouse and keyboard. Um, but what I found now is a lot of FPS players, they pick up Overload, and it's really easy for them to play. They're really good. They can aim way better than I can. Um, and they, they pick, you know, they may not, they're not going to try core. They're not going to do some of the more advanced things that you can do, although they would, they would quickly learn that. But in the first 10 minutes that they're playing, they're actually quite good at it. And I think the FPS skills actually transfer very well to a six degree of freedom game like Overload. If you want to get really good at it, oh, my cat just opened the door. Uh, yeah. um, just, we, we showed really good at it. Go ahead. We showed the game at PAX West a uh, year before last and we were really pleased and, and a little surprised at how quickly people who never played this kind of game could just pick up a controller and get right into it. Uh, I think people uh, people are just a little bit better and more experienced than they were you know maybe 20 years ago where this game seemed a little too disorienting. I don't know I was really bad at like I never really used joysticks much but as a kid mm -hmm. I tried to play Descent and it was like after playing for like 10 minutes, I realized that I was not actually moving. I was just spinning and spinning. shooting at things that came at me. And I realized I did not actually know what the gas was, as it were. Mm. <laughs> but that's right. just me being terrible at that kind of game and also not having had any experience with it before. 
<laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mac. I was I was gonna say I you know this this would have been my wheelhouse because aside from Descent, I remember playing stuff like Dark Light Conflict and uh, uh, Incoming and all that stuff. So this would have definitely have been my wheelhouse. <laughs> like, well, if you want, uh, you can see if the our guests can give you a code. Like a you know a full code. I put myself in the drawing. I think there's only three reacts so far. No no no. I mean a, a real review code. Like those, those yeah the... yeah yeah. No. no no. No, I was just thinking. Everybody was like, oh yeah, this game genre was so rare, and it's like ah, oh, you poor children. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't say rare. I said it wasn't super populated. There's a difference. You know, uh, even even Wing Commander, even the Wing Commander series, technically is the same style of game. No, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, there were um, other games like, uh, you know, a personal favorite of mine was Forsaken, for example. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a great yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. And like, and I'm looking forward to the re-release on that one. It's just, you know, compared to like standard Doom style FPSs, like it's like 20 to one, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I, I think part of the problem is, is that once graphics cards got to the point to where they could really hand a, handle a fully 3D environment, like truly and not just fake it. Mm -hmm. I think that's when the genre started to die off. But there was a good six to eight year stretch there where that was like the go-to for your science fiction, uh, for your science fiction shoot 'em ups. I mean, uh, on the 3DO, I had, uh, I still to this day own it, uh, Shockwave 1 and 2. Mm. Excellent game. Right. Anyway, sorry, didn't mean to go off on a tangent there. I was yeah, just, no, I, there I was... had to, I had to, I had to tell everybody to get off my lawn for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was definitely a time where we felt like joystick games sort of fell out of favor. I mean, there was a lot of great, you know, great games like X-Wing versus TIE Fighter or Wing Commander, uh, a lot of great space games, and and Descent and Free Space were sort of at the end of that, that uh, sort of surge mm -hmm. in popularity. And I think it's been a, it's been a quiet time since then for for great space games yeah yeah those th those were those were the games that things like the gravis gamepad and the 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 wingman oh god i still have it in the box up here i can't think of it the logitech wingman ga and gamepad extreme yeah uh, wingman which extreme, had yeah. yeah those were that those were the halcyon days of those controllers <laughs> I even my my wingman extreme game pads has the has the uh, it has the the MIDI to USB adapter. Jesus, so it still works. So what you're saying it was before the time of the dinosaurs. <laughs> it was the land before. It was truly the land before time. Yeah, it was the, it was the it was the the time before 3D accelerators. Descent three was one of the first games that required hardware acceleration, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that you know that cut down our market a little bit because not everyone had those cards and even people with decent game systems didn't always have them. So it was a, a very different time. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. And um, it's really nice to see a six degree of a freedom shooter with, you know, modern tech and modern graphics. And uh, that leads me to my next question is how is building a, you know, overload um, today compared to the descent series back in the nineties? Well, you know, the biggest thing is uh, is the engine and the graphics. I mean, when we when we sat down to write Descent, um, you know, Mike and I kind of divided up the work in a certain way. I was doing sort of this 3D manipulation stuff, and Mike was doing like the texture mapping and all the 2D stuff. And that's what we did. I mean, for a long time, we made this basically tech demo, uh, and then it was a long time before we, you know, even had an artist and, and started thinking about some of the art and even some of the gameplay that we hadn't really worked out. Whereas on this project, we jumped right in with, with Unity. We actually jumped in with, with Unreal Engine for a very short period, but we jumped right in with Unity. And from the get-go, I mean, there was a little bit of tech stuff, just getting the, the ship to fly right and whatever. But really, right from the get-go, it was a lot more focused on how we wanted the world to look and how we wanted the world to be structured and what the gameplay was going to be like, um, which is just a very different approach. I mean, I kind of miss that, you know, writing the engine stuff, but uh, but now it's so complex that, you know, me and Mike couldn't just write a really great 3D engine in a couple months the way we did. Yeah, and some know, stuff, years ago. I remember the evening you got it running on the PlayStation 4, and it took, to get it running, you know, not 
perfect, but running was what, two hours or something <laughs> like that? Yeah. Right. So that would have been two guys for six months back in the 90s, to, you know, to move it onto a console. Uh, one, one thing that struck me is, so like the code that I'm writing now is very, uh, the AI code, it's structurally very similar to what was written in the 90s. Um, I, I, in my opinion, it, it's far more advanced. The, the, there's a lot more behavioral variety of the robots. Um, they're, they're, I find their behavior to be much more interesting. Um, but it's, it's kind of doing a similar thing, but other things have changed dramatically. The time it takes to create a robot is um, you know, a more advanced robot, not a boss, but just something you know that animates um, and has a variety of ways of firing. It's it's what it's like two weeks, Matt, until that thing is polished and done. And I think yeah. Adam was cranking out robots like two a day when we needed them. It's like we need <laughs> five more robots and they'd be done in two days. And it, it, I don't know how many polygons they had, You know, maybe 50 to 100. Um, <laughs> Dozen. Yeah. Literally dozens of polygons. Yeah, literally dozens of triangles, and uh, you know maybe what two two different textures, one for the eyes and one for everything else. And if they didn't, you know, wrap properly on the robot, we didn't care. You're going to blow it up pretty quickly anyway. So it was assets were way faster to create back then, um, and there was obviously the time that goes into creating assets now goes into the, the visuals of the game and also the immersion of the game but it was easier certain things were easier back then and it's like if you needed a robot that did this that robot would be in the game by the end of the day um, and if you needed whatever a force field or something like that and it, st that kind of stuff happened really quickly um, but we certainly didn't have the enormous foundation of code that you have when you use something like unity and the tool set the tool set for unity is very very good hmm. like uh, was there a particular reason you stuck with unity uh, versus unreal I, I think Luke may have had some some difficulties with unreal uh, I can't I can't remember specifically what they were. Our original thought was that Unreal might be a little more cutting edge in terms of graphics. Uh, that was my perception. I don't think that's really true now. I think Unity is is uh, as good as anything. It's it's and I think we found Unity easier to use and, and easier to work with. There's a so big push. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Matt. We switched from Unreal to Unity before you and I even really were on the project, right? Yeah, it was a long before Mike and I were actually programming, yeah. Yeah, so Luke was on the project for like, I don't know, six months, and then he took a leave of a few months to work on his own one-man games. And then uh, when when he came back, we realized we needed, <laughs> we needed more manpower. Uh, uh, so we hired an artist, Chris Claflin, and then Matt and I joined the team as programmers and we eventually added more people but yeah the whole unreal thing that that was largely a, a loop decision which um i mean i i didn't w really weigh in at all I, I wasn't i hadn't programmed professionally in five years at that point yeah no more than way more than five years at least 10 years so um but i'm really happy with unity it's uh it uh it makes a lot of stuff happen for for a little effort it's uh it seems like the it seems like the up and coming thing i've been seeing a lot of in lieu of ads, I've been seeing a lot of infomercials about learning Unity on YouTube and stuff like That's that. That's right, so, yeah. Up and coming thing? Uh, yeah, in the <laughs> game development space, it's like, it's the thing. Like, well, between... uh, more accurately for new people coming into the field is what I've right. right. Yeah, right. right. It's even reaching a popular, you know, popular recognition where people, people know about it who aren't necessarily, you know, hardcore into games. Right. I mean, it's just, you know, on our show in game development, I've been hearing about Unity for about five years now. That's so, still not as long as, that's still not as long as Unreal. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. I'm just saying, you know, Unity has a certain amount of ubiquity these days that is not surprising. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, the, and it's also, I think Unity's... Um, Reputation has been improving as of late because not too long ago, uh, people would just sneer if your game had Unity uh, as its engine. Um, and th there's a lot behind that, a lot of asset flipping and the fact that Unity as a tool set is so easy to use that you know, pretty much anyone can do it, even if you don't really know how to use it, and so on and so forth. But I'm glad to see that its reputation is being rehabilitated. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great thing that it's so accessible, uh, but I don't think it limits it at all. I mean, I, you know, we've we're putting out a fairly big game, uh, right? And with a lot of assets and a, and a lot of high quality uh, graphics and sound. So I don't, I don't, we've not found Unity to be limiting at all. And in Even, fact, um, I I consider it to be a, a blessing because it actually gives some choice in the industry as opposed to always being well okay it must be unreal Woo. <laughs> or you had to make your own engine which took a lot of time and money mm-hmm. and if you were a smaller studio it was basically impossible yeah right i mean there are two or three i guess there are maybe what four big engines out there now that you know valve source and crytek and unity and unreal so you figure back in the on... playstation era or before that, you were, you know. Yeah, it it kind of depends on what you're doing. Like, there's some other tool sets if you're doing 2D work, like um, Mono yeah. Game or um, uh, Constructor. Like, but yeah, it, it's like there are a, there's a lot of ways to do things these days as opposed to the 90s. There's a lot of great stuff out there for 2D games. That's uh. It's a fun space to be working in, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, another reason why Unity is so um, prized these days is its um, portability. That is to say, you can have, you know, it's not magic button pressing, but you can have, you know, ver- uh, you know four or five builds going on at the same time. And um, indeed, is your yeah. game uh, running on consoles? Yeah, we're running now on on three three operating systems on on PC so we're Windows, Mac and Linux and then we're also running on Xbox and PlayStation 4 Xbox 1 and PlayStation 4 Makes sense. And there uh, is work there is work still to be done on the console side uh, but the you know the basically the game works uh, and there's a lot of like little things we have to get to that we just have not been focusing on but uh, but but the the core work of making the game work was not hard good to hear good to hear and um i'd be remiss if i didn't ask uh any plans for a switch version well um no specific plans right now it's something that we've talked about and decided we were just too busy to think about so after uh, after the game comes out next week and uh and especially after we get a little further along on the consoles then uh, i think that's something we'll want to pay attention to well, I suppose the more pertinent question is, um, couldn't, can you scale overload down to meet the Switch's specifications? Right. I, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know, Matt, maybe you've done more research on it. Um, it, it, it would, that, that would, that would be a project. Um, it would, it would, it would have to, a lot of stuff would probably have to change. It could, you know, the change could be somewhat automated, I think. Um, but, uh, that's, um, that's the question we have to answer. So, really, it, we just haven't had time to research it. Really, so yeah, I think there's going to be a <laughs> a lot a lot more time for uh, you know serious thought rather than putting out fires and uh, getting a hundred things done uh, that you didn't think about every day uh, come June first. So it'll be a lot more uh, feasible to think about a, pla- a new platform like the Switch. Of course, of course, and uh, you know. It- it's just, it feels almost like obligation to ask at this point, is there a Switch version coming? No, yeah. Like... <laughs> I mean, from what I've seen, the, the you know, I don't have a strong sense of, of the technical capabilities of the machine, but it's, you know, it's done really well in the market, and it seems like a really fun little machine, and uh, I think it'd be awesome, if, if, you know, if it's possible for us to be on that platform. Well, uh, it could be possible, like, uh, you know, Doom and Wolfenstein 2 and Rocket League and other big games from the current gen have been squeezed into that space, so it's not impossible. Like, or it could be. I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, so. there are a whole lot of stuff that would need to be looked at. No. But I'm just going on what else is on a on that system. So. Yeah. Anyway... Um, let's see. Does this game have a VR mode? It does, yes. Um, and it, it, in fact, Matt, when you talked about the PAX demo, 
that was sort of our validation of uh, VR as well, that um, th there was a constant line of people wanting to play it. You had to limit them to, what, five minutes or something like That's that? right. Right. And a, some a people nice limited... line and, and no vomiting. Yeah, I could not have <laughs> that would leave it. me out. <laughs> yeah, but it, uh, yeah, we've had, and that was, um, you know, just on the Unity front again. Uh, we had the uh, Oculus sitting, you know, we opened the box, we looked at, it, and we thought, okay, pretty soon we'll get to this. That was back in 2000, in December of 2015, I think. And one day, Luke just decided to get it running on Oculus, and because of Unity support, it was running in a matter of a couple of hours. Um, you know, lots of tweaking to do and so forth. But uh, so a lot of that just, you know, and and then there's, you know, the ton of work to, to really make it uh, a good experience. But um, we've had it running on uh, Oculus since I think before the Kickstarter, right? Yeah, we actually yeah. there's actually a Kickstarter video of Luke wearing uh, Oculus and playing the game. And is this game only uh, available on the Oculus, or is it like all the headsets? It's um, it's not on the PlayStation VR. Um, it is on on Steam. So the it's on, Vive, it's on the, the and Vive, the HTC Oculus. Vive, yeah, yes, so it's right, Oculus the VR and the you. Steam VR, yeah. It it is actually on PlayStation VR, but only in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I suppose that beckons question. Uh, you know, when you get the game finished, are, is there going to be any tweaking to see if you can get it on the PlayStation VR, or is it just the PC VR for now? You know, we have to look at performance. Um, you know, our, our thought is, you know, we probably we probably can't get the performance we would be satisfied with on a, on the PSVR, but we haven't devoted a ton of energy to that because we're pretty focused on getting the PC version out next week. Indeed. And, um... Has the bug fixing been uh, harrowing this past week, or, you know, going into the release? It, um, I wouldn't say that, but then uh, I, I don't touch nearly as many systems as Matt and Luke do, so they have more stuff to do than I do now. And, you know, at, at this stage of the project, um, fixing someone else's bug can be the wrong thing to do. Um, <laughs> you, you can make it worse. So... <laughs> Um, I, I don't know, Matt. W would you describe it as harrowing? No, it's been it's been a a, a much more pleasant uh, time than, than some projects I've been on. So that's been really really nice. That's good to hear. And um, in terms of multiplayer, what's available in uh, Overload? Um, well, uh, in the multiplayer beta right now, there's uh, there's Anarchy uh, one. 1v1, uh, we found from the Descent community that 1v1 is very, very popular. That's uh, <laughs> 1v1 uh, that's me, bro. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, so that, uh, and then there's Team Anarchy. Uh, and we had done a little bit of work towards a couple of team, you know, mo team modes with players having custom roles in. Um, and we, we set that aside. Uh, and, you know, that's another thing we'd love to come back to. Hopefully the multiplayer community is strong and we could add some more advanced team-based modes. But right now it's Anarchy, Team Anarchy, and 1v1. And it, uh, there are, what, uh, 10, 10 um, multiplayer levels now. Um, we are going to release the editor, and we will even document the editor. Um, and... Um, and there's a number of Kickstarter backers that back at a certain level, and we're going to be doing these online level design clinics for them. So we're going to hopefully jumpstart the level design community. Um, and then I'm sure that all kinds of amazing levels are going to get created. So that'll be that'll be really good for the multiplayer experience. Is this game uh, supportive of the Steam Workshop? You know, we have not done that yet. That's something... Um something we've talked about internally and just hasn't hasn't gotten any attention so yeah we need we need we need to look further into that um have you guys had good experience with people. that um uh, us, us personally no yeah like other devs have like, yeah you now it's like seems to be a you know a good community uh tool set and feature yeah one of our programmers was a programmer on the long dark and they they did that and had a pretty good experience. So it's it's been uh, encouraging. Hmm. Uh, 
And um, in terms of the single player campaign, what sort? Uh, how much content are we talking about here? Um, 15 levels, although you may have noticed there's a 16th level in uh, the menu on the second page. Um, they are much larger than set levels. Um, and I would say there, there's deeper gameplay going on in there. Uh, there's more sort of custom designed areas for things like lockdowns and um, other robot ambush type things going on. Um, and then th there's more variance in the AI. Um, so I think it, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what a speedrunner can do on it. I, I'm, someone will do it in under an hour, I'm sure. But okay. for someone new picking up a controller and playing the game, um, I think you've easily got 20 hours. Uh, and, and you know, if if you're the if you look for a bunch of secrets, if you're trying to find everything, res uh, rescue every survivor, that kind of stuff. If you just want to go through and play the game, I think, and, and you're playing it at an appropriate skill level, I think you're probably looking at 10 hours or so. Um, and then challenge mode, I think, is actually a great place for people to develop their skills, and it's sort of a horde mode and. Uh, it's been a, a key component of the early access, and there's people in there with several hundred hours of challenge mode, uh, posting scores. I mean, we can't. Uh, we have to when we when we make changes to the uh, the parameters, uh, and we're not doing that anymore, thank God. But uh, you know, changing how the challenge mode plays, we'd have to go out to the community to have them evaluated for us because no one in, on the team was good enough to play it at the highest skill levels. Um, and, and these people are racking up scores that are. Well, I'm not that good, but you know, like 50 times as much as I would have, and probably five times what the best people in our office would have. So, that that that's been a lot of fun. I played a lot of that, and then of course you have the multiplayer component, which can last for 20 years. <laughs> I, and we, I should mention on the on the single player side, we we have uh, New Game Plus, ah. uh, so that's an extra challenge. And we've done a lot more with uh, integrated story this time than we've done in the past. So. It's got uh, pretty, a pretty detailed story, pretty involved story. We've got uh, a bunch of characters and voice acting and some sort of cutscenes between the levels. So it's, it's uh, I think, a, a little more of a full package in terms of the single-player game. Hmm. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, do you have any sort of uh, post-launch um, framework? Plans like bug fixes or um, indeed DLC. If there's any bugs, we'll fix them uh, and release a patch. So I'm pretty sure we'll be working on that patch the following Monday. Um, and uh, DLC, we would love to do that. I think a lot of the DLC will probably be more about levels, probably more multiplayer levels. It would be great if we can do a team-based multiplayer mode. Um, you know, all the infrastructure for multiplayer, it's it's, it's very solid now, and um, so adding more types of gameplay uh, is going to be a, a lot easier than it was, you know, getting the first, even just getting Anarchy um, going. So we would love to do that, and, um, you know, it, it depends on, on how the, uh, the audience responds. You know, we would love to do a sequel. I think we'd love to take some time off and then do a sequel. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot more we can do with it. You know, like any complex game, you build a ton of technology and you're still learning how to use it when you're completing your game. So that's Indeed. one of the attractions of doing a sequel. Indeed, like um, um, there's a reason why sequels in video games actually tend to be better than their previous iterations because people become more familiar with the tools that they build and such. And um, yeah. I suppose my final question at this point is um, the price. The game is currently twenty four ninety nine, and it's in early access. Is that going to be the price when it reaches a release date next week, or is that going to increase? We've announced a price increase in the press release, and it's gone out in a, through a number of sources. Um, Matt, what do we what do we want to say about that? We, what, what we talked to each I other mean, about today? <laughs> well, sure. It's it's uh, it's selling. I mean, the, the list price is uh, thirty four ninety nine uh, on Steam and good old games. But we uh, we will uh, be offering a uh, uh, what do they call it a release discount. Uh, so it'll be a little bit a little bit cheaper than that for uh, if you buy it in the first week. Okay. 
Um, now I'll turn it over to my cohort to see if they have any final questions for you at this time. Um, I can't think of anything. I'm good. Alex? I have a weird level design question just looking at the play of this. When you design the stages for this, do you think about what direction the player will be treating as down in various areas? We, um, we do. Well, not to matter our level designers, although I probably designed 100 trivial levels to test AI, but um, never anything that was trying to, you know, please a player. Um, but I would say there's definitely a sense of up and down. Some of the natural areas, the cave-like things, um, you lose sense of that. But in a big cave, there's usually lava, and lava is always on the bottom. You know, right. There, there are elements of the overload and the descent world that don't make sense, like it's zero gravity, but the lava is always on the bottom, which is where you would expect lava. Um, and uh, so, yes, there is a sense of up and down. Uh, a really good player doesn't need to care about up and down um they, they will they and, and you want to challenge those players by making things where um wanting to orient in the plane you know that that you would whatever as if there were gravity right so that uh, up and up down is different than left right but sometimes a really good player will reorient the room um to their advantage so um Overload levels are fairly confusing for the novice. You know, the Holy Guide's there, the auto map is there. Um, so you want to challenge them a little bit, but not too much, um, uh, so that you don't want them getting too confused. So a sense of up and down is is a part of that. I, I wanted us to add water, because uh, uh, again, it doesn't make any sense that you have waterfalls in a zero gravity environment, but that gave a very strong sense of up and down too. And uh, I don't know. Luke said it was hard, and <laughs> he just didn't want to do another risky thing. So that that would be great for a sequel. In fact, that's how it was in Descent, wasn't it, Matt? No water yeah. in one. Yeah. Two. All right. Yeah. We can copy ourselves. Again. Just a random thought of that. I was looking at this from remembering when I tried to play Descent, and <laughs> tried being the operative word. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's that, yeah. That's all I got. All right. I, I think that'll about do it. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Matt, uh, it was wonderful having you on the program. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be with uh, us this week. Uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, it's been no a pleasure. Problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. No problem. Hopefully we'll have you on the show um, whenever, whatever project you work on next um, comes to the surface. Um, until then, the game is Overload. It's available now in early access on Steam for twenty four ninety nine for Macs uh, for the Mac, PC, and Linux. Uh, be sure to pick it up before um, May thirty first. Otherwise, the price will be jumping up to thirty four ninety nine with a discount. But you know, um, you can still jump in on that early access price if you buy it within the next week or so. And uh, Petty Fan, play us to the next section. All right, welcome to the topic of discussion. This week, we're talking about Castlevania III Dracula's Curse. Oh, and, boy. Yeah, we're talking about that because um, <laughs> Igarashi is about to release... His latest ode to that game, it's not his first, because, <laughs> good lord, Igarashi loved himself some Castlevania 3. <laughs> Ain't that but true. Yeah. How, but, um, how, many, yeah. how many levels were dedicated to that in all of the other Metroidvania games? A lot. I'm like, and we'll get to that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, more to the point, um, uh, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon is coming out. Uh, tomorrow, in about four hours, maybe yeah, less. About four. Yeah. Um, and if you've seen the trailer for it, um, it's basically Castlevania Three, only bloodstained. You know, <laughs> it's like guys. I'm beginning to think that Igarashi really likes Castlevania Three. You sure? No. <laughs> that might be his least favorite game of all time. <laughs> what? We're fighting vampires and switching between different characters that have different no. abilities? 
I've got it. He hates it so much, he keeps trying to remake it better. <laughs> May not be totally inaccurate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Castlevania 3, uh, if you haven't played it, is not just one of the most indelible and iconic incarnations of Castlevania, it's arguably, um, at the very least, it's among the hardest. Like, uh, no question. But... Uh, I yeah. feel that mechanically it's much more playable than the original Castlevania. No, I, 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 mm-hmm. I it's not as it's not as it's not as clunky. Basically, everything they got, everything they were on the precipice of getting right in Castlevania, they perfected in Castlevania Three. Mm-hmm. See, th- this is what I was talking about in the interview. Like mm-hmm. Castlevania Three iterated on all of the mechanics of Castlevania One and got them better. Yep. Yeah, and they, it was, they, it was, there's it, more challenge, but they give you more tools to deal with the challenge. Mm-hmm. It was mm-hmm. the game that Castlevania 2 should have been. Right. Well, the, the NES has this weird habit, and we talked about this on Sunday, of when there are th- the NES and Super NES in some cases, when there are, is a three-game series, uh, the second one is weird because they hadn't really just, they were not sure they wanted to go exactly with what the first one was. But then, like, the third one codifies the style a lot. Well, and they only improved upon it in Castlevania 4, but that's outside the scope. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, granted, I know people who absolutely hate Castlevania 4 because of the improvements. You know, because the improvements... Because it's too easy. Yeah, the improvements... It is on the easier side of Castlevania because... Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, here's the thing about Super Castlevania 4. The design didn't evolve with the gameplay changes. Yeah, it has no. stuff that like would be hard if you had the limitations. But but, but because but I can you can swing whip in with directions. the whip. I can well, swing that's with the, the whip. Yeah. <laughs> like, not necessarily saying it's a bad thing. It's just I'm saying it is a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, if you like your Castlevania, um, rock hard, Castlevania Three is phrasing. <laughs> I'm like, Castlevania 3 is definitely the way you're going to go. Because mm-hmm. yeah, even with the improved mechanics and such, Castlevania 3 is fucking hard. Hey, yes. at least you can jump onto a ladder in Castlevania 3. <laughs> I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying, you know, even among NES games, Castlevania 3 has a very sterling reputation for being fucking hard. Because it's fucking hard. Like, it's <laughs> also one of the most visually impressive NES Castlevania games. Yeah, I was, uh-huh. I was, I'm, I, I'm playing it now, but I was playing it on Sunday when we were talking about this, and I was impressed by like the the when you're in the clock tower, you're balancing on pendulums, and they actually do a pretty good job for the NES of conveying a string swinging through a whole arc, right? Holding the pendulum up and stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah, Castlevania and the, the rotating gears and stuff. Yeah. Castlevania 3 is among that crop of late game NES titles that really showed you what the developers could do with the time and technique and all that um, history in their hands at that point. Now, Artistically, it is probably one of the densest NES games ever made. <laughs> Indeed. I and- mean, it's just there's just so much going on at all times. I'm amazed that they didn't absolutely kill the NES with all of this. Like when you're in the clock tower, let, let me let me just rant on the clock tower for about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Jesus fucking Christ! Is there enough Medusa heads flying at you? Do you Indeed. see wall? No. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. You're you're Lord. on the you're on the pendulum swinging back and forth and da 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 da. da. You know, it's like ah! I think I think that's the game. I mean, Castlevania helped invent anguish, but <laughs> Castlevania three codified it. <laughs> You're not it wrong. is like the definition. Um they they really fake transparencies pretty well when you're in the level that's sinking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you've got water coming up at you. And you can still see the blocks that are being washed away. Yeah, I mean, it just the the 
in spite of the Nintendo ban on religious iconography, they just couldn't get it all out of the game. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's a four-sided boomerang. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and if my mother and if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a wagon. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, not only um, is the visuals impressive, but um, the sound, the, the music. Oh, mm -hmm. God. Yeah. 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 Now, the first Castlevania, I believe, had music that was like better in Japan because they had an extra channel or something. Is that the case with this one, too? Or? Oh, God, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got fucking jipped out of the um, sound. Yeah, we did. Like, still, they did utilize every channel they had available to them. Like, in some cases, they would even... They did some tricks, if I'm not mistaken, where they swapped out a channel that would normally be used exclusively for sound effects and threw in some musical elements into when the sound effects weren't playing. Mm -hmm. That did give you this kind of... Um, I hate to use this analogy because I've used it before, but they ha it has this Swiss cheese effect. Where where it sounds where it's like you got this, it's just killing it all the way, and then all of a sudden you go oop because you get hit or something like that, and this audio becomes tinny for a half second. Mm -hmm. But so, you know, yeah, a bit uh, more on the sound chip that uh, uh, was in it. It's called the VRC code processor chip, and it allowed the um, Castlevania three to have five sound channels. So it could Im imitate a synthesized string se section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but like I said, it, you know, as good as the music is in Castlevania Three for the Western release, it really does. If, if you ever listen to the Japanese stuff, it really does pale because you know you got two extra sound channels. I I think most of like the um like virtual console versions have the Japanese soundtrack or at least the like extra yeah. channel version. No and. If it's the virtual console, no. Oh, like virtual it. console, virtual console stuff is they're just wrong. So mm -hmm. it's gonna be the old game um, mm -hmm. from way back when. Like Konami would actually have to do a new version of Castlevania Three for that to happen. Like, um, and I don't honestly like ever the 3D that. classics version of the first one could have theoretically. Yeah, it's like something like that, and uh, I don't think Konami's up to do that any time ever. Although, then again, considering that um, Castlevania Three uh, is the basis for the new Castlevania next Netflix series, I don't know, maybe. Uh, now they'll just they'll just redo the Lords of Shadow that had. Trevor. Let's let's ho let's hope it doesn't come bad. But oh, oh I know. You know. <laughs> but yeah, that, that also gets into that also gets into the iconicness of Castlevania Three. Like it's arguably the most iconic because, well, it's had appearances in the larger pop culture since its release. Um, start uh, starting with its unfortunate inclusion in the Captain N series. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Which now, is interesting yeah. because it doesn't have Trevor Belmont, it has Simon, but I think at that time some well, they, people were pretty unclear about the fact that this is not Simon. I actually um, saw that episode, and they actually mentioned that Trevor was dead. Like, dead dead. Mm -hmm. Which was super weird because, you know... Saturday Captain morning N cartoons? Was, well, yeah. more to the point, Captain N kind of worked on... 8-bit video game logic. Mm. Uh, in like, which people who die do not necessarily stay dead. Yeah. You know, people have lives. Like, uh, it's like um, people get killed in, you know, a blast of pixels. Uh, you know. It, it, well, he did only have three lives, though. If he went into a world and died three times before transporting to a different world, he was gone for good. It yeah. was possible for it was hypothetically possible for Captain N to be blanked permanently. I know, I know. It's just you know it didn't really come up because otherwise it you just didn't. Have a series, you know. Yeah, it just it didn't come up. Well, he died twice in one episode, and he's like, oh my god. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, anyway, um, 
the, getting back to the Captain N episode on Castlevania Three, uh, it reinvented Alec Hart into Bart Simpson. Not even. Oh <laughs> yeah, fuck that <sighs> garbage. I mean, they, 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 it's like they, it's like they read the notes and said Dracula's son and said, and they said, I know how cartoon sons are. No, what what it was basically like was like trying to read the Gold Key Star Trek comics. Apparently, they got they got a list of the characters and the spaceship and some production stills and just went to town for 187 issues without ever once watching an episode of the show. So Mr. Spock would be emotional and screaming and Captain Kirk was a coward and yeah and uh you know Dr. McCoy apparently still had a wife. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty was Irish. They didn't give a fuck. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's basically what was going on there. Was like, and what's shocking about that is that while it was an officially licensed Nintendo product because it was associated with Nintendo Power and all that stuff, was that was the complete lack of care and consideration. I mean, the fact that I, why right. why was Simon voiced like Snagglepuss? Because he well. For the same reason that he was like a freaking World War One fighter pilot with a whip for some reason. I'm just so in love with myself. You know, just... Isn't Simon supposed to be from like the 1300s or something ridiculously early? I think it's like the no. 1600s yeah, or but something still. like that. But, yeah. but yeah, he's... It's, they didn't it's, have leather jackets with zippers back then. Or backpacks like that, yeah. yeah. No, it's just, yeah. Or 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 uh, mirror guns. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, or, or hair product. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, Castlevania Three has found more dignity in the um, Castlevania Netflix series. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah, you know, it's like more more dignity than its sequel, Curse of Darkness. <laughs> oh yes, J just because. <laughs> Castlevania 3 wasn't awkwardly translated into 3D. I mean, yeah. there are there are issues with I mean, the there are issues with the Netflix series like um the fact that they wrote Grant uh out completely for reasons. I don't know, is that better or worse, is, is that better or worse than making him a vampire for no or no, a uh, werewolf for no reason? Uh, no, wait, what was he like a mummy in Judgment? No, he's like just some hunched over monster. He says he's a ghost, but they made him. But yeah, but that's him bullshitting because he has. Yeah. Okay, first, first of, first of all, first of all, I'm really, I'm, I'm really shocked and offended that you brought up judgment. <laughs> oh god. Is sec, sec, like is it like as if that shit's canon? <laughs> well, I, I did. I wasn't oh. saying it was canon. I was just oh. pointing out. What are you bringing it up they, for? Stupid. You're trying to give kidding. us all P you're trying to give us all PTSD. What the hell did you bring it up for? I mean, there were I like took six a, things I, I could have mentioned, but yeah, he's doing like his best Voldo impression. Okay, but I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I took a risk even bringing up Curse of Darkness, and you go there. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot Judgment existed. So I'm guessing mandatory <laughs> therapy session after the show. I bought yeah, we're, we're gonna have to have a sit down with HR now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to, mostly, gonna have to, mostly to unlock the all right, all right. Parts in order of Ecclesia. I'm gonna have to break in here because we have yeah, some yeah. breaking news. Um, okay, let's hear it. The bloodstained mm -hmm. Curse of the Moon backer coats have been delayed. Oh. The yeah. ones, Hell. the ones for other platforms are. Right. I just need to mention this. The Steam it's, codes are on. Have already been sent out. I got mine. Yeah. And, People I'm just saying, I wasn't finished yet, okay? What? Like, I uh, just got this update here. Uh, the backer codes have been delayed on all consoles, you know. And, um, let's see, the Steam code lets you play the game until June 8th. So, they're giving a Steam code that will work until June 8th. To the right, people right. We're only getting a console one because of the delay. Yeah. Just to bring things back around to, to why we're talking about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Anyway, and yeah, back to the game itself. Outside of you know its difficulty and 
and the beautiful everything. Uh, this is this is the first Castlevania game that allowed you to play as multiple characters. And, multiple and it characters. actually, like, had multiple characters besides dude you play as and Dracula and then a bunch of bosses between you and him. Right. And they all had different play styles and they all... And they would allow you um, different pathways. Mm -hmm. So um, they allowed for a lot of replayability because... There are, I think, three or four ways into the castle um, in, uh, like, uh, various modes of difficulty. Like, basically going through the base, like, Alucard's path is the hardest, going through the basement and the sewer system. And it's also the longest route, too. And um, we were also talking about this um, on Sunday, but, you know, to show you how much of a sequel escalation this uh, game was. Uh, Dracula has three forms. Mm-hmm. Mm. Usually he only has two. You know, he's... So... Mm-hmm. It's definitely a game that gives you a run for the money. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, anyway, um, closing thoughts on Castlevania 3. It's a video game. <laughs> I'm, it's a fun just, game, but I'm really bad at it. I keep dying in the clock tower. It's one of the best NES games. And, uh, visually stunning. It's it's still one of my favorites to this day. I'll dust it off occasionally and play it on my Retro Duo, too. And uh, uh, the music, everything about it still holds up, which is pretty goddamn amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. And for anybody who's not quite sure... How, that, what gender Sypha is. <laughs> Play through her scenario. Yeah, she takes off She takes off her de- headgear at the end, and I think. A Good. lot of the later games, and a lot of the later games are based off of this. I mean, Igarashi loves the game so much mm-hmm. that it is very, very strongly implied that Trevor and Sypha were responsible for future generations of Belmonts. <laughs> Wink, and, wink, and nod. also, and also, Belnod slash Fernandez is correct. Um, and actually, I think there's even a reference to it in um, da, 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 what is that Genesis one? Uh, Bloodlines, mm-hmm. which is kind of appropriate because the whole Bloodlines angle is a direct sequel with. Descendants who dilute the bloodline a little bit. Mm-hmm. Which gives us Portrait of Ruin. Ah. Yeah, so all in all, all in all, it led to some very good things. I, I wish we could have seen it go through to its logical conclusion. Uh, I, I think it already, I, I think it did in the form of, you know, influencing like every Castlevania. Igarashi did uh, during his uh, tenure with the franchise and uh, I'm beyond. Just, well, I'm just saying that the, the 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 end game was never realized in that plot line, unfortunately, because he got fired in 2010. <laughs> I, I guess. Uh, like, yeah, uh, I'm not real impressed. To be honest, I'm not real impressed with uh, any of the Lords of Shadow iterations of it, except for Mirror of Fate, which is kind of fun. Well, Lords of Shadow was made some really awkward design decisions, even aside from the story oddness. And really I'll say two words. Timeline. I'll say two words. Mercury Steam. Mm. Well, like, a lot of it is, hey, mm-hmm. God of War is popular, isn't it? The, yeah, Mercury Steam and the cake is a lie. <laughs> anyway. Um, In so that'll, yeah, that will about do it for Fragments of Silicon uh, this week. Indeed, the week ahead. So, coming up on Sunday, we have reviews of two games. Steampunk Tower 2, uh, which is a side-view tower defense game uh, involving, well, a a literal steampunk tower. It's kind of weird and very steampunky. Like, maybe pink, uh, peak steampunk. Uh, Anyway... (laughs) Sorry, I just, I was like, wow, that was a long way for that one. 
I- I'm like, I got there though. I got there. <laughs> you did it. I, 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 like, you get a you get a golf clap for that. <laughs> I'm like, and um, City of Brass, uh, of which we have featured on the show uh, previously. Last, um, I believe we did the interview last year, and yeah, the game recently came out of early access. And yeah, it's ready to be reviewed. And uh, let's see, coming up next week, uh, we do have a Tuesday show, and we're welcoming back to the program Ralph Egas of Abstraction Games. Uh, he's got a whole bunch of projects to talk about, uh, chief among them, Arc for the Nintendo Switch, uh, highlight of GDC, and. Also, another return next week, Bill Schwartz of Mastiff. Uh, geez, it's been several years since we had him on the broadcast, and we're going to be talking about their upcoming slate for E3. So, yeah, pretty busy week ahead. Um, be sure to tune in, you know, subscribe and all that stuff to mm-hmm. in the future. And until Sunday, I wish you good gaming. outro. Anytime now, Petty Fan. Yikes. Petty? <laughs> Is he dead? Oh. I think Media Player just broke on me. Oh, boy. What happened? I, I hit the button and it's not opening it. That's too funny. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. God damn Do it, it everybody! <laughs> Everything is working so good, and then media player was like, "Hey, no fuck you." Uh, somebody broke out the wall of machine. I'll edit on that. <laughs> <laughs> good enough. <laughs>